All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Two Geniuses Walk Into a Zoom, and then Joan Shows Up. Uh, we are so excited to have Mary Gray and Tressie McMillan Cotton for a discussion about their incredible work and a celebration of being named MacArthur Fellows, which is known as the, the Genius Fellowship, if you didn't know. Um, which is a pretty big deal. I'm not going to lie. Uh, every year this list gets put out and every once in a while I know someone on it or I've heard of someone on it and I'm pretty excited to have had um, uh, a moment uh, in time with them. But this, this hits different because these are two of my favorite scholars and the public recognition of their work is something that I... Um, I've always, you know, tweeted about and been really uh, delighted to hear them at conferences and uh, other social spaces, as well as um, at home, at work, at play. And so um, by way of introduction, I'm not going to flatter them too much by reading these uh, very long and labored bios that are on their websites, but I do suggest that you check out marylgray.org. The L, of course, stands for lesbian. I don't know. I'm just joking with you. We're going to joke a little bit today. <laughs> um, but, uh, and uh, tressymc.com. Uh, I, I highly recommend you check out their websites, which have all of their work and everything. And uh, I told them there would be a little bit of embarrassment, a little bit of cheese here um, for today. Uh, on the MacArthur Foundation website, I'm going to read just the simple, um, the simple text here under uh, their uh, awards, but I want you to know that they are just path makers and breakers in their field. Uh, there's a way in which you're taught to be a scholar and you're taught to be um, pragmatic in the choice of your your projects, you're taught to be careful in the ways in which you speak in public, and these two do it better than anyone I know. Uh, not like to demean everybody else I know, but I mean, pretty big, pretty big shoes to fill. Uh, so Tressie is known for shaping discourse on highly topical issues at the confluence of race, gender, education, and digital technology for broad audiences. And I highly recommend if you haven't gotten a chance to read her book, Lower Ed, to take a look at that because it is a phenomenal um, close ethnography of the way in which privatized education and uh, the business of education as it becomes digital uh, takes, really takes big advantage of uh, the most vulnerable. And Mary's uh, bio here says, uh, Mary is known for investigating the ways in which labor, identity, and human rights are transformed by the digital economy. And her uh, book, Ghost Work, um, was something of uh, a labor of love uh, as she put it together and uh, crafted the different narratives around how we should understand where humans fall into the, the loop um, between technology and how work gets carried out. She also has a really great uh, body of work early on about um, uh, gay, young, gay youth, LGBTQ youth in uh, rural context. And I think that's where I first got to know her, her public scholarship because Nobody was studying that at the time. It was just not a huge field. And uh, as, as well with Tressie's work in sociology, I'm sure none of the sociologists will be shocked to hear this, but studying things that happened online uh, <laughs> 10 years ago sounded really far afield from what you would want to do if you wanted to land yourself a job. <laughs> and Tressie's work hasn't just been about uh, lower ed or the educational transformation uh, through the digital world, but has also been really about building a field of digital sociologies and bringing everybody to the table that has been doing this work for quite some time, um, despite of despite you know chair chair committees and uh, reviewer two asking the very same question over and over, which is does social media even matter? 
does technology even matter for the reorganization of society? Can't we just do this without technology? And I think that Mary's work also has been confronted by um, very similar critique without evidence, uh, where in anthropology, you know, the way in which you study technology has to be connected to the everyday practices of people as they deal with uh, new regimes of, of digitization. Welcome, my friends. How's it going? Going pretty good. Hey, John, I tell people when they ask me that, uh, you know, lately, I'll go, are you kidding? What do you mean? How's it going? <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Everything's great. Uh, <laughs> even the things that aren't great are great. I um, uh, not an optimist by nature, but uh, even I wake up uh, uh, on the right side of the bed these days. Good, good, good. To see good to see y'all. Yeah, it is. Mary? This is what I have to do to get in a room with Tressie and Joan <laughs> at the same time. I, I think, I mean, this is a really high bar. I can't, I can't keep this bar. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. I, I, I had to embarrass you first, uh, but there'll be plenty more to come. Um, I actually think it's important, though, that we do talk a little bit about the ways in which our identities are part of our entry into our fields of scholarship, mm -hmm. um, especially as we talk about early careers and our choices that we make in deciding, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of graduate students listening and and they've received different kinds of advice about, you know, following your passion versus following trends in the fields and how important certain kinds of uh, methods are gonna be. Like in my day, it was big data. If you didn't know how to do big data, you weren't gonna get a job. And I was like, I don't really care. Like it doesn't, like it's not driving me to want to know more. I wanna know people in their individual situations. So I'd love to hear a bit about your early career resource research choices and, and the balance of picking a, a project that you're going to, you know, really love to hate by the end of it, um, and how that has really shaped uh, part of the part of your entry point into uh, your new work, which we'll get to in a little bit, yeah. whoever wants to go first. Yeah. Tracy, do you want me to? Mary, you go. I'm thinking, I'm putting, I mean, it's that question. I mean, we get a version of this a lot. I know Mary does, um, who frankly has been out there sort of, you know, creating um, a subdiscipline conversation uh, certainly longer than I have. And I've been in the rooms where students have come just to ask Mary basically that question, which is how do you survive, right? Um, and then when you ground that in identity, the question of survival is actually about more than just professional success. I think people are quite literally asking us, <laughs> How do I survive me, the person, um, before we even get to like being the thinker or whatever? Uh, and you know, the my answer for that is is a really complicated one, which I'm not sure people uh, really like. I think people want a um, you know chicken soup for the soul kind of answer, and there isn't one. Uh, I don't think. I th uh, so the first thing is, uh, I had a dissertation advisor, Rick Rubinson at Emory, who told me very early on. Uh, he's just a really practical uh, guy, which was perfect for me. He's very pragmatic. He was just very like, eh, you'll be fine. You know, and as someone, when you're, when you're living in a constant state of high anxiety, that's so thrilling. And so uh, I'd go to Rick's office, you know, spinning out and he'd go, eh, you'll probably be okay. And that was just so nice to hear. But one thing he told me once about, you know, choosing a project, um, and I can't say he was thinking about the identity piece, but he, he did help me understand what a commitment it was to choose your project. Mm. It, I mean, when you choose a project by a committee, it's kind of, I tell people it's like choosing a spouse by committee. Yeah. Because that's how long you're living with it. Yeah. Uh, and Rick was like, no, you need to choose something. He said, people are going to ask you about this for 20 years. Yeah. And nobody had put that sort of frame of reference together for me. Um, and that, you know, that kind of helped me a lot. It helped me understand the risk of choosing what I was going to do, because it's a different risk assessment to my mind. If you're saying it's something I'll do for three or four years, yeah. I'll get the project out of the way and move on. But when you tell me it's something I've got to live with 
for 20 years, that changes the game for me. And I wish that we talk more about career, not as your first job, but as like your last job. Yeah. Like what do you still want to be doing on your last job? Yeah. I, I, I like that reframing of it because I think in many ways I have maybe the benefit um, and now it feels like a benefit, but going into graduate school before I understood this was a job or was a career path, like and the program that I went to UC San Diego, uh, communication, um, the, the communication department, for the most part was um, a setting for misfit toys. <laughs> like it was, it was folks who were coming to graduate school because they had political questions they wanted to answer or to, to address at the very least. But I don't know how many people at the time, how many of us thought we're being, we're being um, uh, developed for a career track. I, I think some people were just more aware of that than I was. And so I feel like um, in a good way through most of my graduate training, I didn't understand that I was making a decision to live with something for my natural born days. I mean, it's like free bird, you know, when people contact you and want to talk about, you know, your earliest work. I love that work, but um, I, I like that your point, like I can't even imagine settling on a topic based on following what I think a committee might be warm to. Um, and at the same time, when I started my academic career, it was quite startling to realize I did need to explain it in, in terms that were going to be palatable, um, that would have a clean narrative about this is why I study what I study. Um, because I, I also um, think that when you follow those trends, that narrative is kind of handed to us, right? So it's, um, it's really working without a, without a net to, to follow what feels like um, personally I mean, Joan, to your to your to your um, question and point, like these these questions are deeply personal, incredibly important to me, and that means I'm always pursuing them with a certain kind of heat and charge that I then I take it personally <laughs> when people aren't you know um, invested in them in the same way, and that can that can mean I've got enough energy to keep going. Um, but it's also quite draining. So I, I think, uh, Tracy, I love your point. Like when people approach to say like, how do I survive this? They, they really are thinking, I think about that similar sense of you're doing this because you know it's important and there are folks who don't think it's important and how do you deal with mm -hmm. um, that constant friction of mm -hmm. pushing and pulling these topics along? You know, and I, I, I ask you this because I think it's important to set expectations for people that are in these fields that want their work to be seen, want it to be read, and to know that um, it's okay to question the advice that you get along the way. It's okay to think about what paths are going to be important to you. And, um, you know, I'm one of the unfortunate sociologists that have never really been able to even land an article in a sociology journal because yeah. they just don't, you know, there's just like this kind of way of writing, kind of way of doing things. The approach, um, our award-winning article on white supremacist use of DNA that I wrote with Aaron Panofsky was rejected several times from very prominent journals before uh, we found a place to publish. And I do think though there is, um, uh, an expectation in some respects, especially when you're doing work that matters, is that it's going to defy some of the conventions of the discipline. It's mm -hmm. going to make the discipline have to think about where it grounds its priorities. I'm thinking here too about Biela Coleman's work on hackers, you know, and how that fits into the anthropological landscape, which I'm sure it's very uncomfortable, right? Yep. But you do have to balance that curiosity with also thinking about uh, everybody else and how your work is going to land in this world if you are doing things that are both interdisciplinary and may eventually end up affecting either corporate policy or government policy. Can you speak a little bit to that balance of, I have some 
questions, some may be more esoteric than others, but how do you balance that study where you think about where do I go deep and how do I then take what I've learned and make it generalizable and understood well enough that people who are practicing in these fields could take this knowledge and potentially even redesign the way they operate. I never imagined talking as much as I do to policy people, which may have helped. I mean, I just, you know, it's just not my jam. I mean, I, I mean, God bless the people who do that work, but uh, you know, it's just not my jam. And so I, um, but my uh, first job was in Richmond, Virginia. And so I was within like a stone's throw of DC. So I think there was one thing, like it was just like a geographic convenience. And then the second thing is that I was doing this thing that was just really present, you know, it was a present tense sort of project. Um, and so much of it was unfolding uh, in the policy world. So I ended up talking to policy people and I'll say it was a learning curve. Um, there was probably less of a learning curve for me talking to publics and mm -hmm. even maybe talking to other sociologists. While talking to sociologists is always going to be weird and stilted. Like I got, you know, I eventually, I think, got that genre of how you do it. Uh, speaking to, the, to policymakers is, was actually not as natural mm -hmm. to me. The things I thought and that what I finally figured out is that even when we agreed on the ends, we were starting from such different mm -hmm. uh, ideological points of view that you know there are different ideologies under our shared ideology of like, yeah, we might be progressive and yes, we believe in these sort of like basic democratic principles or something. Um, but like, for, uh, you know, let me just be even just more concrete than that because I'm trying to be kind and I, maybe it's okay if I'm not. And you know, <laughs> I walk into and I think you're there, you know, and I'll think I'm there to talk about the work that I do. And my work is absolutely just grounded in a set of basic assumptions, which is that black people are human, uh, black women are rational, that uh, women's economic lives matter, uh, that constrained choices are, um, are political decisions and we can just make different political decisions, right? Um, so they would agree on the parts where like, yes, you know, uh, profit extraction is predatory, but then I get into the room and realize, well, they didn't share any of my other priors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I didn't, and it took, so it took me a while to understand that even when we were sharing the language, we were not sharing ideological priors and I had to make some decisions about how much of that I wanted to do. And I, I do it now, not as a, because I feel responsible to the policy world. I do it because I feel responsible to the people whose lives I've used, you know, as data, that it, it matters that I'm in that room on their behalf to the extent that I can be. Um, and so I'll, you know, I'll take an L for the team, but I still am not always sure about speaking to policy people, but you know, John, we're sociologists and I get it. I don't want to be one of those people that becomes precious about power, mm -hmm. right? This is how it works. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm always befuddled by sociologists, especially who want to pretend that status and power don't shape our own work mm -hmm. in life. Mm -hmm. So I, I really try to like, um, you know, keep a check on myself about becoming too precious to deal in policy circles and conversations, because that is where power is often negotiated. And that is shaping people's lives about the things that I have said I care about. Um, so I do it and try to learn the genre and try to participate in the um, in that discourse and conversation to the extent that I think that I can do it, you know, in a way that's valuable and doesn't compromise me uh, too much. But yeah, I do it because I just think that's our fundamental responsibility when we extract people's experiences from them. Like I can't always, because of the nature of what I do, I can't always have, um, you know, uh, you know, do some of the full circle um, uh, research processes where you bring the data back to the community and et cetera. Do it to the extent that I can, but I always, can't always. So I have to think about sort of like broader public way of be having a check on the ethics of my research. And that's one of the ways I try to do it by going out into like public policy circles. Um, but yeah, I'll be honest with you, I'm still a little uneasy about that, but I hope I stay uneasy about it, I'll be fair. Yeah. I don't wanna get comfortable yeah. in those rooms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I actually, I love, I mean, I think it's making sure those rooms still feel unsettling to me is my way of, of checking where I'm at. And I, I think like Tressie, for me, it, it, 
I know how much I owe the people that I've learned from for all of my work. Like I owe them to be able to be in a room and represent their interests and voice their concerns. Like that's always in the back of my mind. Like I, I have what I have and, and um, I'm able to do what I'm able to do because they gave me their time quite literally um, to, to share their experiences, to let me in their lives. And so I, I do feel a sense of not just probably responsibility and debt, um, quite literally. So I feel like um, certainly that's my sense of Tressie's power in these conversations is that she's bringing the public into settings where they they really are excluded by, by structural um, oppression. And so being able to come into a I mean, policymakers should resonate with publics and they don't, they often don't share those priors. They really do have, it's quite, it's still quite surprising how much they work with an assumption that's demeaning and belittling yeah. of the people they, um, they're there to either represent or um, to, to serve in some capacity. And yeah, I feel like um, being able to be in those settings and not, um, leave them unsettled with their own assumptions is actually, maybe that's part of part of the job. Um, but yeah, I couldn't agree more like folks who feel like it's, it's that they're somehow outside of those mm -hmm. courses of power or that they can rise above it all or that like that just drives me bananas. Me too. The above it all is what I, I can almost kind of get to like, you know, absent minded and maybe, you know, and don't notice it. But the people who think they're above it, I that I, that's that one's the personal affront to me. Yeah. Uh, of course, because, you know, not all of us can choose to be above it. And yeah. So. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. And I feel that same um, uneasiness when I am called into rooms that aren't, uh, you know, fluent in the debates that I'm fluent in with the, the kinds of disciplinary commitments that we make. And then also they haven't done their homework. I mean, they literally have not read. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but some of their aides and some of their staff have, and that's why yeah. we yeah. end up there, which yeah. is oh, the aides save it for me, by the way. Let me just say so if it wasn't for because the aides tend to be younger and more diverse yeah. than mm -hmm. the candidates or the you know, the in the policy or the you know, the talking head or the lead researcher, yeah, it's the aides, it's yeah. really they, um, who will often get it and who will be honest with me, they'll go, Listen, we are trying to get them to see X. Yeah, yeah. And these are our students, right? I mean, these are often yeah. like, these are our students. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. They're, they're usually fresh out of a program. Yeah, yeah that, yeah. They, well, I they, often tell my students at, at uh, HKS in the policy school, I say, you know, power really lies in that middle range with mm -hmm. the people who get you in front of the people who mm -hmm. say they matter, right? Yeah. And, and even with corporations too, if you want to move policy within corporations, you really want to talk to people who are in that that middle range that understand the complexity and then also know which levers they got to pull to make things happen. Um, yeah. Before I get to the next question, I do want to let people know we're using the chat function. Feel free to drop a Q&A in and I will ask the question if it's, uh, if it's you know, going to help us move the conversation along uh, as we do this. So please feel free and, and you too sit tight you don't have to read those things i'll take care of it that's my job as a moderator <laughs> ignoring the comments is ignore the comments you know i go in there i just start trolling i, mean, I, <laughs> I know just, right I yeah mary in the Zoom background troll. is like posting as anonymous attendee it's which so is bad. like what that's kind me. of shampoo do you use why does your <laughs> hair look so good today um yeah really or you know our spouses sometimes will pop up in the comments with can you come out and Go come down and feed the cat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, um, let's pivot a little bit to talk about uh, your new works and the new places you have found yourself, um, especially as we think about, talked a little bit about the support that you've gotten from mentors and colleagues, but both of you uh, are in, you know, different positions. Uh, Tressie just made a very big move over to UNC, is going to be um, really pushing that institution to think more deeply about the, the work that is, um, uh, that is foundational to her scholarship, but also be mentoring some, probably some of the best um, 
scholars in the field as, as they learn from her. And, and Mary, you're situated at Microsoft Research where you do quite a bit of teaching and education around ethics and getting people to understand that you don't just drop a new technology in this world without really thinking about, um, you know, how to land the plane. Um, yeah. And so I'd love to talk a little bit about these new uh, projects, things that are uh, happening or on the horizon, ways in which, uh, you know, your current book, Ghost Work, for instance, how that has changed uh, the direction and the course of the research uh, moving forward. So I'll start with you, Mary, and then uh, we'll go to Tressie. Yeah, so that that work is a collaboration with computer scientists at RS Surrey, and it was um, it was really the first time I you know I I really moved out of um, the comfort in some ways of um, of doing anthropological ethnographic work, and and you know focused on folks experiencing technologies that were clearly not built for them. They were clearly not who technologists had in mind to shifting to this world of distributed labor. And again, where the folks who built these technologies did not have workers in mind. Um, they, they were thinking, we're just gonna build software that can you know, manage what workers might be doing and then sell it as software that doesn't involve people at all. So much of the, you know, the, um, what follows from that project is to keep raising this question of what assumptions are we making about who um, can value these technologies, who can get something out of them, and what are the obligations of companies building technologies um, to, who, to, to the folks who they imagine will be either end users, I hate that phrase, um, or consumers, uh, and to see more broadly, you know, these are not objects. These are not, you know, technologies aren't, you know, CD-ROMs and shrink wrap boxes on a shelf anymore. Um, they're really social environments. And so what are the obligations that come with building social connections and environments? I mean, I think we are genuinely at the beginning of that collective conversation to see technologies as as conduits connecting us. That's that's now mainstreaming. I mean, I think we're still stuck in these conversations about it being it being addictive. Like I would be so happy when we turn a corner and, and start talking about us. What do we want to do with these, these opportunities to connect in different ways? But that, you know, for me, that means um, continuing to push what are the ways in which work environments that are happening through uh, ways of distributing um, contract-based work are done with awareness of the employment conditions, the work conditions, um, the opportunities that they are going to produce and constrain. It won't be one or the other, it's always going to be both. So what are, what are we doing here when we think about technologies as sites of employment and not go to easy answers. <laughs> I hate easy answers, like something that really keeps us on the hook for um, what that means as um, companies decide their uh, procurement um, formulae, like boring, boring stuff like that, um, that I find fascinating. Like what is this new supply chain, um, that language, you know, how do we, how do we really think the ways in which we've treated contingent labor as disposable. How do we rethink everything about, um, about our valuing of service to each other if we're in a world of service economies? And the more immediate thing I'm working on is actually around COVID-19 and what it means to think about telehealth from this perspective. If we think of, you know, whether it's caring for an elderly parent and prompting them to take their medication, um, that that can now be um, a kind of work that creates opportunities and certainly serves a need in society. So what's going to, what's going to maximize the, the way in which that becomes sustainable for the people doing it and for, for the person who's receiving the, um, the consumable service of that kind of care? Like, what does that look like? in the thick of this pandemic. 
And, I, you know, I can't appreciate more the ways in which you're able to make science and technology studies sound so <laughs> digestible, uh, especially as you you just talk through that project in my head. I'm just I'm hearing echoes of Susan Lee Starr and and uh, as well as um, Tom Belstorff and and other friends and fam from the field. And, you know, that um, attention to the ways in which we're shaped by the study of boring things, right? If I told people all I really care about is how infrastructure connects together and how that changes the way people do things in the world, yeah. people would be like, your scholarship is so boring, right? But the point is to figure <laughs> out how to connect those theories and ideas and concepts and then evolve them as conditions change, like the, the different kinds of uh, study that we have to do in the midst of a pandemic that feel non-negotiable in the sense that if we don't deal with uh, the ways in which people are relating to one another through technology, yeah. then uh, we're susceptible to all kinds of other problems, including um, capture by the market. And one story about when I first um, met you, me and Kevin Driscoll drove down from LA to the, the big mm -hmm. conference being ho hosted by Jeff Bowker and Tom uh, over at UC Irvine. And oh my gosh, that's great right. Day. You had an amazing slide deck that day, just chef's kiss. Uh, and you talked about data being people and not to forget yeah. that. And uh, it's just been something that I've kept with me as I think about this moment around we shouldn't treat people as data being circulated through these technologies. We do have to move from the it to the us if we are going to make a difference. Um, Can I just say it's even more pressing in the thick of a pandemic because watching the justification for data capture that's in the name of we're in the middle of a, of a pandemic is um, gut wrenching like that we are still um, that we are still so able to to fall for the story that if we just have enough enough data that that will solve the problem means that we're not paying attention to people who are sick we're literally just trying and trying to make them you know healthy again we're focused on can i get the data from those three hospitals that seem to be the site of you know huge events and and they're not even seeing the people and the families connected to those mm -hmm. um bodies and it's just like it, it i can't even talk about it without getting angry <laughs> Uh, but that's, you know, I think for me right now, that's the most pressing thing is to get people to stop um, repeating this belief that, oh, you can just divorce um, data from people and that's the cleaner way of learning what you need, need to do next, that there's, there's some um, extraction that can, abstraction that literally means we'll get to the bottom of things because we don't have to interact with people. It's, you should um, blame sociologists for that. Uh, that's on us. For no, some, some of it anyway. It's a teeny bit, a, but you know, throw there's a whole field Ambro that that loves to, to, to play that game but, of making yeah. individuals into aggregates. And speaking of sociologists, Tressie, I'm <laughs> not going to let you off the hook here. You just made a big change. You are now. Uh, uh, a host, a co-host of an incredible podcast. You, know, you have a new book out, Thick and Other Essays, um, and you're at a new institution. So I'd love to get the update on you from, you know, where things are transitioning and how you're thinking about your research uh, in this moment. So at the end of uh, Lower Ed, I talked to a few hundred students about in for-profit colleges about how people perceive their credentials, um, which is really just questions about their aspiration and their constrained choices and the gap between what they think they're doing and what they can ascertain other people think that they're doing because somewhere in between the two are where constrained choices become material and structural limitations. And they're overwhelmingly women because most women in that sector, most students in that sector are women and then they're disproportionately black. So basically I was talking to a lot of black and brown women and uh, they would say to me, uh, you know, they've got $190,000 in student loan debt. They're in an online for-profit PhD program in clinical psychology or organizational psychology or any of the health sciences or in education. Those are leading ones. Um, 
all the health degrees and education degrees, we created that mess. And, but they, uh, and they would say, oh, well, if people don't think, you know, I'm qualified for a job, I don't get the promotion I'm going after, if this thing doesn't turn into the occupational mobility, I think that it should, I'll just go into business for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, I'm going back and forth to DC and all these other policy places. And structurally, the way policy is made is that you do higher education and you do workforce development and the two actually rarely speak to each other. Yeah. Uh, they're rarely the same people. Uh, but one of the things that technological change does, and it did it happen with the telephone, it happened with the railroad, this part isn't new. Scale and efficiency are new. Uh, but this underlying social relations, which is anything that networks the globe more tightly to each other, one of the things that that technological change does is more tightly couples things like credentials and work. So the, the way that we govern and make policy and understand those things as being distinct is a holdover from like an early 20th century model where you either go to school or you go to work. Right? You're either getting a certificate that says you're qualified to do this thing at a school or you're going to work and getting hands-on experience. And that those are even sometimes thought of as separate subdivisions of the labor market, right? Mm -hmm. Like they, as if they are governed by entirely different rules uh, and assumptions. Uh, but one of the things that digital technologies had done is it was collapsing this, what had always been really a kind of false divider, had been one for quite some time and was collapsing them. And I just kind of couldn't let go of the idea of I wondered what happened to those women when they went out there and decided to quote unquote work for themselves. Mm -hmm. Because here's the story about uh, women trying to work for themselves. You don't do it, women by and large don't go into business for themselves, no matter what the narratives about girl boss are, you know, all those kinds of things. We're usually pushed into entrepreneurship. It is not the pull of entrepreneurship, it is the push out of the paid labor market. Mm -hmm. um, the push gets stronger, the browner and poorer you are. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, by the time you're like a black trans woman, uh, uh, you're actually being kicked. You know, the, the shove becomes, you know, kicking the ass out of the paid labor market. And so entrepreneurship is doing very, something very similar to my mind to what higher education attainment had been doing the last 20 years, which is we had written this narrative of economic opportunity to cover up a more efficient regime of predation and extraction. Mm -hmm. So what we told people for 30 years as it became almost structurally impossible uh, to move from the quintile, uh, income quintile of your circumstances of birth, or basically to earn more than your parents over your lifetime, to move up a quintile or two, uh, come almost structurally impossible for many people over the last 30 years is we just told everybody to go to college. Right. Just need a degree. So we'd written a narrative of economic opportunity right. out of right. what was essentially a structural problem of mm -hmm. extraction and predation. And then we're doing the same thing with these with these conversations of entrepreneurship. And when I talk about it, I one of the things I wanted to do is move this conversation. One of the things I'm working on doing is moving that conversation um, so narrowly out of uh, job work, you know, job focused work. Um, as important as that literature is, like the, the gig economy literature um, is to that work. I come from, you know, a different understanding of black political economy where all of the underlying social, realization, social relations of something like Uberization has been true for black workers since they yep. entered the paid labor market. Yep. So I call it the hustle economy. And that's just to try to get at sort of a broader set of social relations and, um, and particularly try to cap capture the work that women are doing. Uh, because what women's work is increasingly looks like, uh, especially during COVID, we're just seeing a sort of distill distillation or crystallization of it, uh, is as women are being kicked or pushed out of the paid labor market, there is also a pull at them back into the private sphere. Yeah. So the economic activity is happening in these places that aren't marked as economic platforms, right? So when you're making money on um, eBay, this we understand, it's an auction, right? And we've got all the economic rules, we know how that goes. Well, what happens when that economic activity happens on Instagram instead? Mm -hmm. which by the way happens a ton. Instagram is actually one of the most popular economic platforms uh, for women who are doing micro entrepreneurship. And we do not think of it as a economic platform. 
Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that we're doing with uh, that were my move to UNC is sort of building on what the hustle economy looks like. We're doing a study right now. Uh, our timing was just fortuitous and that we started speaking to women the week before the very first shutdowns happened at the start of uh, the US response to COVID. Um, and so what we've been able to do is kind of follow them through the cycles of grief, <laughs> as we call it, the cycles of grief that are basically happening because everybody was gung-ho the first couple of weeks, by the way. I'm talking to women who have totally bought into, you know, I work for myself, again, girl boss, lady boss, 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 boss up, all these wonderful terms. Somebody should do a paper on those, by the way. And, um, you know, this is their time to shine. They're getting ready to rock and roll. They hustle. Uh, you catch them about three weeks later when that child care is kicked in, three more weeks after that, when it becomes increasingly clear that uh, social policy is not coming, right? That there will not be another stimulus check, et cetera. When the partners that they had in their lives who maybe understood their hustle six months earlier suddenly become less understanding um, and the gender divisions of labor become more stark. And so we're just following those right now over time, but as part of sort of a bigger project of what happens if we understand women's economic lives um, as being indicators of how all of our occupational lives are changing and are delimited by these structural changes and how little occupational mobility and income mobility is possible. Um, and we're starting, you know, just with the narratives of the lies we start to tell about that, first of all, because what happens is that the minute that becomes branded as economic opportunity, it mobilizes a whole set of policy assumptions, but also intellectual assumptions yeah. about who's doing it and how that works and what the rules are. Uh, and I think much like lower ed, I just think the rules have changed and nobody was keeping their eye on the ball. So um, I'm doing that. Uh, more importantly, I think in the short term is I think I'm writing about Dolly Parton and that's super important. Say just, more. Just thought, oh, yeah, like, well, don't podcast. leave, but I mean, you're just like, this and is that, how you end your podcast, right? Is like, yeah. and tune in next week. <laughs> if, I explain, if I've got to explain why writing about Dolly Parton is cool. I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I've got albums. Like, she's got albums full of truth. Like, I'm ready. I'm ready. There's no reason to explain that. <laughs> but it is. Well, uh, I realized I'd never done it. And I thought I should do that. So one of the first things that happens when they, you know, or the second or third thing anyway that happened to me uh, after they call you, I was like, damn, I can do anything I want to do. And yep. so well, what do I want to do? And what I wanted to do was write about Dolly Parton. So that's what I'm doing. That's amazing. I think that it's important too, that we not rule out the role that culture plays in setting those ideas of what our goals can be, what people do. I have a, a friend and colleague, Kelly Nielsen, who's got some new research out about uh, education. I think, Tressie, you probably, I think you blurbed the book. Um, and, you know, this idea that if you've got a bunch of nurses in your family, you're probably going to grow up to be a nurse. Right? And so the ways in which people learn and have role models and have uh, interactions with different culture, the way in which they're motivated by um, music, uh, especially, is is really important way of understanding how people end up in these positions and how they rationalize what's happening around them and how they can communicate with their friends and family about that. Um, we have some interesting questions in the chat. I'm gonna try to roll some together. Um, one from uh, a person who could very easily take any one of our roles here, Lisa Nakamura, mm. who's asking about, what? I know, what right? Like Lisa's watching, oh, like shit. everybody get, you know, <laughs> straighten up in your chair. You know, Lisa has been um, sort of one of those people that's been doing this forever and has inspired yeah. us. Um, but one of the, the questions is about this notion of like, how do you center people who are unseen in your research and how do you uh, take account of the way in which their practices, um, you know, inform other policy or other ways in which we should be uh, paying attention, right? This is a question about the ways in which we often overlook uh, and want to get at things that are a bit more mainstream. But if you study people that are not marginal, but living on the margins that are doing, uh, that are living in a kind of bricolage world where they're taking things and repurposing them and, and making it work, 
how do you uh, translate that into um, more bigger picture uh, stakes in, in, the, in the work that you do? Um, and then we have a couple of different questions about COVID, but I'm going to hold off on those. But thinking about that, you know, making the, the, the folks that are often less visible putting them in the center of the work that you're doing, how does that, um, how does that really impact both the field and, and potentially, uh, at least uh, in the US anyway, our, our way of doing things? I mean, it's funny, because I used to, I don't know if I joked about it, but I feel like um, part of my career has been finding the people that people think are hard to find. <laughs> and they're not hard to find. Um, we, don't, we don't look for them. And so, you know, that I think in many ways, the, the politics of visibility for me, and I certainly learned this from, from my advisor, um, it's about looking at the construction of who's seen and, and not seen. Like, how is that amplified? How is it muted? And to see that as power moves all the way through and, and people contending with those power moves, sometimes being less seen as a safer place to be. So, centering, I, and I love that question, Lisa, because I feel like centering their experience, it starts with drawing the reader's attention to, um, to reflect on why they, they are hearing something or hearing from someone they've never heard from before. That's about them. That's not about those people. So particularly for the most recent project, like, um, and I really got a lot out of comparing the US and India because in so many ways, being able to draw attention to these workers who know each other, are connected to each other, that was probably the most mind blowing thing for my colleagues and for my co-author was, wow, they connect with each other. And that is the most obvious thing um, that people would connect with each other to be able to survive and navigate um, work settings where they are um, not just um, discouraged from connecting, but, but technically blocked in most cases from connecting, that they would see each other um, and that they would be forming as many opportunities as possible to, um, to connect with each other. They, they are not invisible. <laughs> There's nothing invisible about them. It's the construction of their, um, of seeing right through them and not seeing their experience. Like that's the thing, like drawing, like I think that's for me what I'm centering is attention to, um, for again, the reader to see the assumptions they're making um, about who is there, who they expect to see, what they expect to see from them. And I wanted to circle back, like I think from lower ed, I really learned from Tressy thinking skill. I stopped really using that word in any um, uncritical way after your work, precisely because I, you know, I, it's this, especially the idea that education is about skilling up and what people are missing is they haven't skilled up enough. How insulting, <laughs> how completely um, we are missing the construction of who achieves and where they move in life and how we've hooked it to this idea of self-improvement, that education is this you know, this way of um, getting the right skills and that that somehow can lead to particular outcomes. Well, it's the whole story we've been telling about how concrete skills are as the little blocks we acquire, that is the problem. Like, how do we, how do we challenge that? So center it, that, I feel like that to me is, is um, for any project I think I've done, that it's centering that through the experience of people who themselves are living that and, um, and are swimming in that story as well. And not dismissing you know, their sense that they're lacking something or that they need to acquire these skills. Like I take at face value their belief that that's true and I can still critique um, that we all are asked to believe these things. And yeah. Yeah, I love that idea too of like finding the people that people say you can't find them because yeah, they're everywhere. It's just, nobody's asking, right? Nobody's looking. Tressie? Yeah, I say the same thing that I think that it's something about the idea. I hate this whole construct of the hidden history of X 
or the, the, the secret you didn't know, uh, which of course is a, a, a popularization of the idea that there's such a thing as an official archive and that the archive is definitive and authoritative um, when all of it is of course just a negotiation of uh, social constructions and ideologies and money. Um, I always like to throw that one in there because I don't want to get too far away from the fact that the money matters. Yeah, right, the money matters. Um, and I, when I talked about, I said to someone yesterday, like it's not hard for me to center uh, black people in my work because I think black people are human beings. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> my job is to study. <laughs> that's actually the easiest part of my work. I yeah. think the question for me is like, why is that so hard for you? Yeah. Um, which gets to Mary's point that it is not about the, the centering of the people so much for me about centering the eyes that are seeing in that if I focus on why is this so phenomenal to you yeah. that uh, you get to sort of like the everyday life of social distance and the everyday life that to me is like you know, talk about how we make and remake racism and sexism and classism. And I go, you know, it quite literally is in your choice of seeing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, yeah, it's just it's so not ever hard. It is harder for me um, to locate in others, the, the presumed reader or um, who I'm trying to convince with the argument. It is harder for me to um, locate the weakness in their assumptions than it is for me to center people that mm -hmm. I think are human beings mm -hmm. in my own work. Um, it, that is for me the intellectual exercise. I mean, uh, you know, it is kind of what makes it challenging um, and therefore enjoyable to me because I'm easily bored. I'm so easily bored. So I have to find a challenge. And one of the challenges like for me creatively is when I find that, when I find that moment, when I find that weakness in the presumed reader's ideological assumptions and argument, and I worm my way in there. I mean, one of the greatest, um, I don't say compliment, because they're better, they're, there are other compliments that mean a lot to me personally, but one of, I will say, the most gratifying reader responses I get um, is that white men love to write me. I mean, <laughs> I just can't fathom how much free time they have. And I mean, God bless them, but they'll, you know, I get so many letters. Not a week has gone by that Thick, for example, hasn't come out that, and they, overwhelmingly start the same way. I know I'm not your audience, but I know I'm not your audience, but you taught me, you actually taught me something. I know I'm not your audience, but you made wow. me consider. And it's fascinating to me how similar the construction of that is across a categorical group of people. Because what I think they're fundamentally saying is you made me care about something that I have a lot of incentives not to care about. And what it usually signals to me is I found the most basic unit of shared humanity in an argument. It means I kind of got the, I found the weakness in their own ideological scaffolding. And so that often means that the craft of the argument work. And so that's, it's enjoyable for that reason. And also just like really fascinating how surprised they are uh, to have found in themselves. They think they're flattering me, but they're flattering themselves. They have found some new dimension of their own humanity. Um, by acknowledging um, that other people are human in the same way they are human. Um, so that's the reason why it's worth doing. Um, and then it's also just, I think, worth doing if I do nothing else in the public anyway, in public, what I try to do is model what it looks like to take us seriously. What does it look like if we actually lived the principle of humanism? What does it actually mean for me to think that Black Lives Matter or that uh, black uh, intellectuals are worthwhile or, um, you know, that women's lives are worthwhile and their intellectual energies are worthwhile. And if I just model that, uh, then that's always worth it for me. I couldn't agree more. And it's a very, um, it's a very difficult thing to hone an argument style. And that's one of the things that I find both very compelling uh, and uh, admirable, almost to the point of envy uh, of the works that you put together is that the stories feel like you're being um, led along a journey around uh, a very particular lived experience, but then it becomes incredibly illuminating for how um, structure and agency 
tend to struggle with one another, right? So I'm not going to close out by asking you to fix society and just tell me exactly what we need to do to make sure that like people start yeah. reading you more, getting getting this. I think society has always been a process, not a product. And the way that we approach this um, world should, should be with um, the possibility for change. And so I would love to hear from you a little bit, though, as we close about gratitude and to talk maybe about one or two people in your lives that have really sustained you as a, a scholar has fed you when you refuse to put the computer down and, and go to bed um, and just, you know, um, speak back to folks about, you know, recognizing the, the unseen labor in our lives um, that make sure that we, we do hang up the phone eventually and, and come to bed. Um, uh, just because I think that it's uh, an enormous um, and I, I couldn't agree with MacArthur Moore, an enormous recognition of the work that you all have brought into this world and cultivated over uh, years and years and years of, of deep thinking. But I know it ain't all about you. <laughs> and so <laughs> yeah. if you want to just uh, recognize someone, uh, in, someone or a few people in your life that have really um, made sure that you are able to do that work, uh, mm -hmm. we'll start with you, Mary. Mm. Uh, my partner, Catherine Guthrie who's read every word I've ever tried to write. Um, and not always, in most cases, not that willingly, but, but, um, but was willing to do that. And we've been together 22 years. I feel incredibly humbled and fortunate that I've had that support. And I feel um, I, I fit that, uh, that statistic about academic partners who have somebody in the background who's supporting them. Like I'm painfully aware <laughs> that uh, I, you know it's a privilege to have that support. Um, I, you know, Social Media Collective has been incredibly nurturing, precisely because it lets me roam. Um, so I have to give a shout out to the folks in that collective, um, and honestly, a, a group of old friends who. You know, at different moments, I, I really didn't know this was a job and I really didn't think it was a job for me. And having people along the way who said, well, we're gonna love you. You don't, they weren't in this job in this racket either. And they literally said, we're gonna love you the same. You don't have to keep doing this. Yeah. And I think one of the most valuable things I ever heard was from really good friends who said, you don't have to finish your dissertation. That's not important. That doesn't tell us to love you less. So I could finish the dissertation. And the same thing happened with the first book, the same thing happened with the next book, the same thing happened with the book after that. So like, you know, there before the grace. Otherwise I wouldn't be doing any of this. One of my mother's favorite sayings. I don't hear that once a week. There before the <laughs> grace of God. All right. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a product, you know, I come from a community people. Uh, I come from a village people. That's just the way we get down. I, I don't understand myself as a, um, I, I mean, some of this is also about, you know, I've recently moved home. North Carolina is home for me. Um, my parents are getting older. So I'm very emotional about these things right now. I think I feel in a, just a very concrete, emotional way, my ties to generational lineages and generational community, to my family and to place. Um, so like I am a product of a, a inherited set of ideas and beliefs and like women who just made decisions at really important uh, political junctures that just changed everything, that just changed everything. I, um, I think about, uh, I have a book upstairs. It's a, the letter that in, in the book is a, it's a 1919 copyright, 1919 geography book. And it was my great grandmother's mm -hmm. uh, that she gotten from one of the children's schools, I think, because she herself didn't finish the eighth grade. Uh, and so she was clearly tutoring herself at home through her, mm -hmm. kid, her grandkids' school books. And you can see her notes throughout the geography book. Mm -hmm. And in the back is a letter uh, that was sent from a uh, employment agency in New York, Harlem, uh, to you know, poor black rural communities throughout the South, throughout the Great Migration, encouraging the women to come north and do um, uh, domestic labor uh, to change their families' economic lives. And it's the letter that was sent, and my grandmother and my uh, and her sister 
answered that call and went to New York. And I just think about these like really portentous moments when the decisions that were made that made me possible were made mm-hmm. to seem like they're individual choices, but like every single one of those shaped and made me possible. So I think about them a lot so much these days um, and what a kick they would get <laughs> out of how those choices manifested uh, in me. Um, They would just think it was remarkable that so many white people listened to me. They would certainly think that's hilarious. Uh, But I also think they would just be deeply proud of the fact that that their choices had lived on in these sort of generational ways. And I hope I pay those forward. Um, And my friends have held me down. I mean, I do have some of the best friends and my friends are like my family, which is what happens when you're an only child as I am. And so to call them a friend is actually maybe a bit of an understatement. Uh, In many ways, uh, my closest friends are my siblings um, and who said to me at every point in this juncture when it was not clear that the decisions I just knew were the right decisions for me, um, were the decisions that other people would honor, who just said to me every step of the way, and they still say to me, you have never made a wrong decision for yourself. Mm. Why are you doing this today? Like you've never made, and they keep me grounded in this sort of like uh, uh, my own historical narrative, right? And, um, and so often give me the confidence when, I, when it's most lagging to make the choices that I think are the best choices for me that honor what I believe in. Um, and then, you know, I'd be run out of here if I didn't name my mother, Vivian, and all of those people. Uh, but She's a bit of a meme. Yeah, <laughs> a, bit, a bit of a meme. Uh, yeah, it's going to make a documentary about that mm-hmm. woman one day becoming a meme. She's, yeah. Uh, so you know, I'd be run out of town if I didn't acknowledge her. <laughs> Um, And if I didn't acknowledge and I had an opportunity to see some of them recently, because again, one of the great things about being home is seeing so many of the people Mm -hmm. who played important roles in your life. And one of them is a professor at my undergraduate institution is the first person who uh, forced me to go online. So actually you can blame uh, uh, Kali Fulford for everything that has happened (laughs) after that point. She forced me to start a blog for a group writing assignment. (laughs) And and look what the hell happened. We're going to get thank you notes now. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I mean, uh, yeah, way ahead, way ahead of the rest of them. <laughs> I want to say thank you uh, to you both for entertaining me for this hour and to Berkman Klein Center for for hosting us. Um, I think it's really uh, important that your work is acknowledged for what it really is, which is a, a big steaming pile of intelligence. Okay. I know it's so hard to take a compliment, (laughs) Um, but I tell you, um, I can't recommend your work enough to people in the field. And then also just the ways in which you comport yourself at conferences and are available to graduate students, the mentorship that you provide to people in the field, the opportunities that you open up for everyone. It doesn't go unnoticed. Um, I being some of the, one of the early beneficiaries of a flight out to social media collective all so many years ago. Um, and I just want to say that um, as you're, you know, now fully recognized as geniuses, uh, you know, let Catherine and Vivian know as they're telling you politely to take out the garbage and uh, and keeping you grounded in your world. Um, is that thank what you. keeping us grounded? Is that what we call it? Yeah, I mean, well, I, yeah. I often think about like what people would think of me if they saw me sleeping on the floor of the airport as often yeah. as I had to do it. You know, they'd be like, oh, Joan Donovan, world-renowned sl- scholar and airport sleeper, right? So uh, there's always a little bit of humility with the humor. And, um, but again, thank you so much for spending this hour thank with you. us. I couldn't have you. had, uh, you know, a better person to cheers. And so thank you. And I will, I will see some of you sooner than later. Um, and let's, let's keep it live online. Everybody feel free to to put in their mentions, compliments, and that you enjoyed the, uh, the talks today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you.